Good evening, everyone. I am deeply honored and greatly joyed, overjoyed, I should say, uh, welcoming you on behalf of DiEM TV to this latest installment intended to offer escape and hope in this time of confinement and frustration. For where I sit on a tiny island called Egina, outside, very, very close to the coast of Attica, the coronavirus seems to have had three effects on our political reality. Just three very brief comments on the effects of this virus on our world. Firstly, it has magnified magnificently the never-ending crisis that began in 2008 and which has been morphing in all sorts of different sub -crises. Secondly, it has proved that the government can act and must act massively in the common interest against everything that Thatcher and Reagan have been saying since the late 1970s. Thirdly, this crisis caused by a silly, mindless piece of RNA, this virus, temporarily revealed the true nature of politics, which is the question of who has the power to do what to whom. The question for our evening tonight is very simple. How will this change society? And is there a realistic utopian vision, a realistic utopian vision of society after the virus that can help avert the nasty of scenario of what might happen? In grappling with this question, I cannot imagine a better DMTV guest than an artist whom I worshipped as a teenager since the early 1970s and whom I have been honored and so pleased of getting to know much earlier in my life in the last five years. Brian Eno, the co-founder of DiEM25. You know, I get a lot of pleasure by announcing Brian Eno as the co-founder of DiEM25, who's here with us tonight with me receding, as I'm not used to be doing, as this is not my occasion, this is Brian's occasion. So Brian, where is the hole in which you are hiding from the virus? Where are we speaking to you from? I'm in Norfolk, in the east of England, probably the part of England closest to the continent, actually, and near where you used to teach, I think. You were in Norwich, weren't you? I was, I thought you were in Suffolk. No, what? I'm just just across the river. Just across the river. So that's yeah. very, very close. I used to, to ride my motorcycle from Norwich to Ipswich. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you, you, you probably passed through this village on the way. Well, I'm looking forward to coming back to it. Uh, so, share your thoughts with us before I convey to you the questions coming from our audience. You know, what would uh, a vision... Okay of the post-virus world look like, one which is worth fighting for? Well, I think we can see the beginnings of it. One, one thing that I've noticed in the last few weeks is that there's been a sense of relief among people that they could suddenly be nice to each other again. I, any of you who know English politics for the last five years will realize it's been very, very bitter, very divisive, a kind of anger stoked by the media, um, particularly the type of media who support our present government. And for um, five years, people have pretty much been at each other's throats. And it seems to me this upsurge of sort of solidarity of some kind that's happened in the last few weeks is not only um, the sense that we're all in this together, but also the sense of hey, you know, we can actually be nice to each other as well. We can be kind to each other. We can help each other. And I have to say the mood of people is, of course, they're frightened of the virus, but at the same time, they're sort of delighted to be able to like each other again. So that is the beginning of something, I think. And it's something I hope we won't forget. Um, there's it's as if we're rediscovering certain things that had been forgotten for quite a long time. We're rediscovering that we like each other's company. 
we're rediscovering that we can do creative things together, that we don't have to be dependent on having our entertainment supplied to us all the time. Um, we're rediscovering that certain parts of the community are very, very important. You know, when they came up with this um, um, distinction a few weeks ago of essential workers, okay, those are the ones who are allowed to continue living <laughs> life outside. It was interesting that nearly everyone that was classified as an essential worker is one of the lowest paid people in our society. The essential workers are the people we don't pay very much, essentially. My, um, my daughter is, my middle daughter is a doctor, so she's, she's a junior doctor, so she's in that category. Um, but the, this wonderful sight of people coming out on Thursday nights and applauding the National Health Service and applauding the people who work for it, and not only the NHS, but all sorts of carers, this, this is sort of the, a recognition that carers, in the broadest sense of that, are the people who keep society running. It doesn't matter a fig if, if all the bankers disappear for a year. Nobody would notice the difference. If the nurses disappear for a year, we would notice it the following day. Yes. You know, so so there's, there's a sort of re-evaluation among people of, of who we are and what we're worth. Um, and of course, the, the nice part of that news is that the health service will be safe for a few more years. It'll be a bit harder for them to sell it off to big American corporations as they were planning to do. So I'm hoping that there'll be a, a relief on that. But what I think we, we are facing now is a, a sort of interesting moment where we, first of all, are... Um, designing the future of civilization right now. The things that we do in the next few months will persist for a very, very, very long time. Um, all the kinds of emergency powers that get put into place now will not be easy to get rid of. Um, you can see this if you travel in any airport, the emergency powers that, the residual powers from 9-11 are still in place and I don't think they'll ever be removed. And so we have to be very careful that we don't end up in that society, a society that is dominated by the sense of fear and emergency and threat. Um, and so I'll talk about that for a little bit. Um, I think what we risk now, I'll go back to what we, what we could aim for later, but what we risk right now is the kind of voluntary surrender of power and control to the state. The, the most efficient way to concentrate power is to encourage a situation in which people are willing to surrender it. Um, and this is a perfect example of that. You know, I, I was talking to a friend who I would regard as a very sort of liberal anarchist friend. And we were talking about what was happening in China in terms of surveillance and so on. And he says, well, bring it on. That's what I'd like here now. And okay, I can understand in the heat of the situation that you might think that, but we have to be very careful with that kind of um, sense because I think that there's always a sort of dialogue between um, security on the one hand and freedom on the other. And the more security you have, the more freedom you sacrifice in general. Um, and it's very difficult to go to step back from a situation of security to say, actually, we don't want that much security any longer. We're, we're prepared to live a slightly more risky life for the sake of having some liberty. Um, that is, I think, is always very hard for people to do. And I think historically, it very rarely happens. It happens with individuals, but not generally with societies. Generally, we, civilization keeps trying to, of course, um, gather more security of all sorts of things. Um, now, the people who would like to control power understand the value of an emergency situation like this. Um, the, for instance, just think of after 9-11 what happened when suddenly there was a huge industry built up called Homeland Security. Um, 
and Homeland Security has had hundreds of billions of dollars spent on it. Nobody really knows what for, um, but it's a self-sustaining feedback loop, you know. Um, and it, it gave rise to this wonderful phrase of the 21st century for security reasons. Um, that's the way you are told that there are certain things you can't do. You can't do them for security reasons. And that is a kind of unquestionable phrase. Um, it doesn't even need to be explained. You're just told for security reasons, you cannot do this. Um, and it's, it's a way that the powerful justify their, protect their actions basically. Um, what we are now, I think, is we're sort of going onto a war footing. And this is of the Western mind, um, where one way for democratic governments, so-called democratic governments, to achieve consensus is to create a threat big enough for people to all want to agree, to all want to do the same thing, not to want to complicate the business of government. Um, and war is a very good way of doing that. Um, you know, we can see in the past how often it's been used as a resort for rulers who feel that they're threatened. They um, imagine or generate or create or promise a war and, and um, suddenly the uh, population is unified or in fact it becomes possible to enforce unity. But to have a war you need an enemy. Mm -hmm. In the past those have been other tribes or other races or other nations or other ideologies. Um, even recently immigrants were the enemy. Um, that's what gave us Brexit. Um, but I, th I think this is the first time in history that we've actually declared war on another organism. Um, in fact, not, as you say, not even a very impressive one. <laughs> this is a piece of RNA. Um, but it works because it, it gives you all the benefits of being at war. Um, it enables you to constrain social freedoms and so on and so on. I understand fully the need for those constraints right now. Um, I am worried and I think we have to be very careful to make sure that they don't fossilize in place and become the way, the normal, the way we live. So now to go to the more positive aspect of this, what kind of future could we imagine other than that rather dark one I just suggested as a possibility? Um, what, what I'm really hoping is that the, the skills that people are learning in these few months, maybe it's gonna be longer than a few months, the skills of sociability, of being together, and working with each other and getting around the huge gap left by conventional industry suddenly stopping. I hope that those skills will become part of the way that we build the future. Uh, Richard Sennett said something very, very nice in his talk last night on this channel. He said, um, solidarity is a craft. And I like the idea very much that it's something we work at, something that we do together, um, something that we have to practice and something that we have to refine, not something that happens automatically. He, he also said, um, uh, I don't believe that solidarity is the product of rage. I think those are his words. Um, and that also, I think, Yes, think about solidarity, not just as, a, as the result of anger. Anger is part of it. We need a bit of that. But we also need reflection and care and thinking, thinking about each other and saying, what can we do together? What can we do together now that we could never do before? Because remember, um, we have lots and lots of new tools. We're using one of them now, actually. <laughs> you know, the fact that we can have conversations together um, a thousand miles apart and thousands of other people can witness them and in some sense be part of them. So 
So there are new tools for the craft of solidarity. Um, and I hope we'll use those. But speaking of solidarity, if I may interject just for one moment, uh, I was um, uh, touched by your mention of uh, the uh, recognition of essential workers. Mm -hmm. Because um, uh, people like you know, our comrade uh, Slavoj Zizek on Team 20 TV the other day said something really pertinent. He said, you know, those millionaires, billionaires who isolate themselves on their yacht in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, uh, they cannot isolate themselves unless there is an army of proletarians working for them to isolate themselves on the bloody yacht, right? So there are essential workers. And I remember when DiEM25 was putting together our European Green New Deal, we made a point of um, extending solidarity to what is now recognized as essential workers by making a distinction which progresses, progresses very often forgot to make between the innovators who are essential because they create tools like the ones that we use now to communicate and they are you know those tools are the stuff of progress there's no doubt about that but we also made the point of honoring and referring to the maintainers to the ones who maintain all technologies like sewers mm -hmm. like national health services like mm -hmm. social care like you know um providing food to elderly people at home. This is very low-tech craft. This is the craft of solidarity, as Richard Sennett was saying. So now we have an opportunity, you know, to highlight that which DiEM has been trying to do, which is to say, yes, we need innovation. We need to support the innovators, but we need to support even more the maintainers. Uh, but my great worry, and this is my question to you, um, is this. The fascists are pretty good at looking the maintainers in the eye and saying, we are going to look after you and you, we are going to make you proud again. Think Mussolini, Matteo Salvini, Donald Trump. They are very good at that. Mm -hmm. So progressives seems to me to have our work cut out for us because the, the fascists are even better than we are. Mm -hmm. are the people who are actually doing the solidarity work on the ground and giving them in my view, a false sense of importance on the basis of hating others, of yes. demonizing the foreigner, the black, the Jew, the German, the, you know, the Palestinian, doesn't matter who it is, the other. So mm -hmm. how do we navigate in the midst of this coronavirus, this terrain where the heart and soul of the maintainers is being contested by the Boris Johnsons, by the Kyriakos Mitsotakis in my country, by the Golden Dawn, by the Alternative for Deutschland, by the Nationalist Internationalist. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, this has become much clearer in England recently. Everybody knows that the NHS has been under attack for quite a long time. And suddenly, they're the heroes of the day, even to those politicians who've been responsible for attacking them. Um, so I, I don't think there's too much ambiguity about it right here and now in England. We, we suddenly do realize who the essential workers are and we realize who has been supporting them and who hasn't until now. Of course, um, the, the difficulty is that the fascists are always prepared to lie and we, we aren't. <laughs> and they, uh, they'll just make it up and they'll rely on their control of the media to make people forget that they ever said what they said. I mean, the performance of Trump in the last few days has been astonishing, where he's consistently said things like, I always knew this was a pandemic, and I always knew this was... And apparently, um, a lot of people believe him. You, yeah. you, it doesn't take very much research to see him saying exactly the opposite. So, but this, this is a... I think, as so much of what's going on at the moment, this is a sort of media problem that we still have, even though we're, we're talking now on a new kind of medium, we still have in place a medium that creates the sort of atmosphere around things. Um, you know, you and I were both involved in, to some extent in the Jeremy Corbyn campaign. Absolutely. And seeing what was the most naked exercised in propaganda, I think that has ever happened in British history was 
really quite astonishing to see how carefully cultivated people's opinions were about Jeremy Corbyn. I remember I did a little bit of doorstepping, you know, going round and knocking on people's doors and saying, will you vote Labour? And what so often happened was people would say, mm, I'm not sure about that Jeremy Corbyn guy, you know, and you'd say, what, what do you, what's the problem exactly? No, I think there's just a feeling about him. And it was incredibly vague, but that's what mass media are very good at doing, creating vague feelings. It doesn't have to have any real underpinning to it. You can keep chipping away at all the stuff they put out and say, but that isn't true and that isn't true and that isn't true. But there's still the smoke. The smell is still around. Mud you know. sticks. Mud, What's that? Mud, mud sticks. sticks. Now, I've got a couple of questions from our audience, if I may. Uh, mm -hmm. One is, um, I think this is a good question. Uh, will this virus change the normal of the West? Or have we faced, or are we facing the end of normal? That's one question. And the second question is, well, start with that one and then I'll come with the, the second one. I think we're facing the end of normal for a while, yes. Um, I mean, when, when uh, you suggested or told me the title for this, um, the future after the virus, I thought, I actually have no idea at all what the future is going to be like. Um, I know what I hope for and I know what I fear, but um, very likely the result is going to be a mixture of both of those and, and more, you know. So I think the end of normal has already happened, actually. Um, I don't think we're going to just get the industries working again and slip back to the nine to five jobs. There are going to be so many things changed. Um, for instance, just as I say, what we're doing now, how many business meetings are not going to happen as a result of this? How many flights are not going to happen? Because people think, you know what, I can do it on Zoom. It worked fine. Or I can do it on whatever platform. So I'm not worried that um, uh, people fall back to old habits and ways very quickly. It's a little like, you know, being stopped in the motorway. You know, you're doing 120 miles an hour. You get stopped uh, because it's a 70 mile hour zone. And, you know, you get fined. So for the next 20 miles, you drive at 72 or 68 miles an hour <laughs> until you don't get stopped for another 20 minutes. Then you go back to where you were before. Is there no uh, fear that, you know, once this bloody thing goes away, uh, yes, we are going to have much greater levels of poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. The stock exchanges are going to bounce up immediately because, you know, so much money has been pumped into the financial sector by central banks that, you know, they, they, they will go through the roof and the, the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times are going to be celebrating the immense recovery of capital. And so on. But, of course, real level investment in quality jobs and in care jobs and so on will have plummeted. But who gives a damn amongst mm -hmm. the makers? And then it will go back to normal. Isn't that the, uh, look, I, the, in 2008, I have to tell you that I felt that, that that was the end of history, not the end of history, but a turning point. And it was a yeah. turning point because capitalism has never recovered since then. At least financialized, globalized capitalism has not recovered since then. And yet, even though it never recovered, and this is today we have a, an amplification and acceleration of the same 2008 crisis. But nevertheless, you know, most of society was lulled in the same way that they, 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 they internalized the critique of Corbyn. That, you know, there must be something wrong with Corbyn. I mean, there is no s smoke without fire. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, the crisis has been overcome. The system is resilient. Don't you feel that, you know, in three years' time, two years' time, five years' time, you know, this COVID-19 thing is going to be remembered more or less in the same way that 2008 was remembered. And then the same old establishment will be reviving the same old claptrap about, um, you know, <laughs> the importance of having a budget surplus and, 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 and fighting, you know, those who are um, constantly asking for the state to create money on behalf of the many. Yep, I think that's very possible. And I think that our mission is to make sure that that doesn't happen. That really is the mission, particularly of artists, I think. Artists are the people who 
in a way provide the sort of material for for imagining different futures um, that's that's one of the things you do with art art is a way of trying to experience what it would be like to live in a different world and that world might be represented by something elaborate like a Charles Dickens novel or War and Peace but it might be re represented by something as simple as a pop record it's it's all about wh what you do when you make art is you make something that gives you the chance to experience another set of values and relationships and so on and we've really got to start working on this now that's really got to be our mission i think i think we have a little window when people will still remember this period possibly fondly in some ways like british people still remember the blitz as though it was the most wonderful time of their lives and what do they why was it wonderful it was wonderful because for the only time in their lives probably they felt unified they felt together and they really belonged to something and i think what matters to humans more than anything else more than money is a sense of belonging the yeah. sense of being part of something and people love that feeling and they miss that feeling if they don't have it and they when they don't have it they fill that by various false sorts of belonging like um owning stuff um having that red sports car that that sort of it's a surrogate for actually being part of something real and meaningful um and i think for a little while for the next maybe three four or five years people are going to remember this time it's it's a spectacular difference in our lives and what we have to keep telling is the story of what happened in this time that was special and unique and positive and wonderful and i th i think a lot of artists will be working on that. you know we know we know the bad side of the story it's awful people are dying um people are have living in terrible situations because they have to stay in one small room with a large family all of that we know the bad side we have to also try to remember that we can learn something from this. And I, I feel what you're saying in my bones because, um, you know, um, I remember I grew up in a military dictatorship. Uh, you know, we were constantly in fear of the skilled police breaking down the door and abducting my dad, my mom, my aunt, only because they did. <laughs> it was yeah. not. An idle fear. It, it actually happened. Uh, yeah. The beauty of that awful military ironclad oppression was because you could recognize the bloody enemy. They wore a mm -hmm. uniform or they looked like thugs and they would break into your home and take you away. Uh, one question we have from the audience is, which, you know, I know what the answer to that is. But nevertheless, it's an important question to pose. Is this the end of neoliberalism? Because you see, the problem with neoliberalism is that unlike a military dictatorship, unlike the blitz that you mentioned, where you could see the Stukas, you could see the Luftwaffe, you know, you had traces in the middle of the night, and you could see the bombs coming. You knew where the enemy was coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, the difference with neoliberalism is that no one is at fault. Because as Karl Marx explained beautifully, I mean, so b vividly and, and poetically in Das Kapital, Volume 1. Yeah? You can't blame the capitalist because the capitalist lives in fear. If he does not explain the workers, he will go bankrupt. If he goes ban bankrupt, he becomes like his workers. If he mm -hmm. becomes like his workers, he's finished, his life is finished. So he needs to squeeze the, 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 the proletariat. And then he needs to take every penny he makes out of them and like, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge, he needs to invest everything, live a miserable life, you know, except the bankers, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but in other words, in neoliberalism, I mean, I experienced that in the Eurogroup, uh, Brian. You know, I could see that if any of those ministers who were trying to destroy our people, if they were at all convinced by what I said and stated that they were convinced, they would lose their jobs immediately. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's like uh, uh, 
the, the, the uptight line that I was talking with people whose salary depended on not being convinced. Uh, <laughs> so nobody's at fault in the end. And this is the, the, the intense and uh, just irreversible, to some extent, power of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. that no one's at fault in the end. So do you think that COVID-19 is going to be to spell the end of neoliberalism? Um, I just read an interesting essay by uh, Douglas Rushkoff called Post-Human Utopia. Have you, have you seen that? I don't know if it's a recent piece or not. Post, it's called Post-Human Utopia. It's by Douglas Rushkoff. Yes, yes. I have. Um, and he describes going to a meeting. He was hired to talk to a meeting about the future, um, about what technologies will be around and so on. And he went to the meeting, which paid him the equivalent of half his salary as a university lecturer for a year. So it was a very big sum of money. And there were only about six or seven people at the meeting, and they were all very wealthy men. And what they really wanted to know was, how do we escape? How do we get out of this situation? They felt that the situation was on, already on a trajectory towards doom. There was no future. They weren't talking about coronavirus, by the way. It was before that. This was just the general notion of, um, you know, the future is, is a mess. What, how will we get out of it? Or how will we protect ourselves? Now, these are the same people who own ranches with huge numbers of um, proletarian guards around them in Nevada and places like that. They're people who really don't see a future. Now, these are the wealthiest people in society so it's interesting to me that they have given up trying to guide society in any way or to try to mold it all they want is to protect their their world their power and their privilege um, and they the rest of us we're going to burn in hell for all they care so it's kind of encouraging to me that they've given up that yeah. means that that means that we can take over if we're lucky, if we're smart. Um, you know, we can't, we can't, after this crisis, go through a, a repeat of the 2008 scenario where nobody, you know, everything goes back to some kind of normal. We have to, we have to say, look, we've realized now that social services matter. Care matters. Caring is what a society does for its inhabitants. Um, and it needs to be paid for. So I think, I think this will be a very good time now to start saying tax havens, let's get rid of them. Uh, I think it would have a lot of popular support now. I'd go further than that, if, you may, if I may. You know, because I'm, I'm in the process of writing my own utopia at the moment. I have, I'm writing a book which I, I have to finish by May on what I would like the world to look like. Um, and the one thing I would ban is be, besides tax havens. Actually, I wouldn't even need to ban tax havens. I would ban share markets. Uh -huh. Completely. Interesting. Uh, you know, you, you, when, you, when you enroll to a, to a college, art, art college, university, whatever, you get a library card. Yeah. By right. You can't sell it. Yeah. You, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't have it if you're not a student. Yeah. And you use it in order to give you certain privileges. I'd like to live in a world where, you know, you work for a corporation, the moment you enter, you have one share, like a yeah. library card. You, yeah. can't, you can't buy it. If you don't work in it, you can't have one. Yeah. But yeah, that's another question. Look, okay. I have... I like it, I like it. Let's, let's, I've written let's, a whole book about it. It's coming out in September. So, um, this was, you know, my, my pitch. Now, I've got a question here. Actually, I have two questions. May I ask two questions? and then you answer them in, in whatever order you want. First question, okay. I, I'm going to read it out for you. As an old admirer of Brian's work, I'd like him to say something about a new culture and art for the post-capitalist apocalypse new world. That's the first okay. question. Okay. And the second question comes from Srechko Horvat, our comrade from DiEM25. And it says, our DMTV guests obviously touch their faces too often. <laughs> <laughs> do I? Love voices again. He said that we both do. I don't know. I didn't even notice it, but Sergio said we did. And someone asked whether Brian 
would create a similar ringtone like he did for Windows for social distancing. <laughs> so my question would, would Brian create a sound for each time someone touches his or her face on our DMTV? <laughs> it wasn't the first on the list of things I was planning to do with this time. <laughs> but, but I'll think about it. <laughs> but I think it's a funny, fun question even to pose. It's, it's a very good idea. Question, though, about, you know, art in the post-capitalist, post-COVID-19 world. Yes. So, well, of course, this, this is the kind of thing I think about a lot. And I, I suppose that one of the problems we have in ever talking about art is that nobody knows why it's important. You know, we all understand why food is important. We all understand why exercise is important, but we don't really understand why art is important. And that's partly because the people who traditionally talk and write about art are such bad thinkers. They're so unclear in, in the way they think and they're so unclear in the way they articulate. And I really think that this is a discussion that I would like to have. I, I don't know how, how far we go. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go onto a little tangent for a few minutes here. Go um, okay. Um, it's your platform. All right. So we all know that play is what children do. Okay, play is how children learn to understand the world. They touch things, they squeeze them, they pretend they're other things, they, they do all the things we call play. And nobody would say to a child, you're wasting your time doing that. <laughs> it's, it's clearly an essential set of tools for learning social skills and learning physical skills and understanding the world. Now, then at a certain point, we, we send people to school and we say, now you're properly learning things as if they weren't learning all that time before. And quite soon, to tell someone they're playing becomes a sort of criticism of them. You should be working, not playing. So my theory is that art is really a way of continuing to play throughout the rest of your life. It's continuing to engage in, that, in those ideas of pretending, thinking about materials in different ways, seeing how things fit together, seeing what you're excited by, um, wondering why you were excited by those things. Um, so my formula for this is um, children play, children learn by playing, adults play through art, through the experience of art. And I think you can either play directly, that's to say you can make art yourself, um, and far more people do that than we generally recognize because I was included in the category of art dressmakers and cooks and people who build things, who make things out of nothing. Um, those are all artists as far as I'm concerned. Um, and we never, we don't stop doing it for the whole of our lives. We, we either do it or we watch other people doing it. We listen to people's music or we watch them dancing or whatever. Um, now, what is the point of all of that human activity? Because we do a lot of it. The first thing people do when they can get past the basic problems of staying alive, of getting enough to eat, or not even getting very much to eat, is they start to make art. They start to dance, they start to sing, they start to write. Um, what are they doing? Why are they doing this so much? And I think it's because the most essential thing that humans have, the, the only thing that makes us really different from anything else in the universe, that we know about is our ability to imagine. Our ability to think about something and to examine something that doesn't exist outside of our minds. So we, we're constantly, all of us, creating other worlds in our minds. Even if that other world is simply, I wonder what it would be like to go to that restaurant with Jean and John on Friday evening. I wonder what that would be like. That's, that's a creative thing as well. That's an imagination, act of imagination. So that's what humans do. That's what makes us special as a species, what makes us able to survive. And we need to rehearse it all the time. We need to keep doing it to, to be good at that. So 
Anyway, this is all a very long way to get into answering the question, which is, I think if we start to understand the importance of art in the ecology of our lives, in the way that we understand the importance of food and exercise and communication and so on, if we start to understand the importance of this deliberate and continuous act of imagining that we call art, then we start to take it seriously and we think this is something we have to have. We get away from this horrible idea that the, the only important things for students to learn are the STEM subjects, as they're called in England, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I mean, those are wonderful things. But Let me make a small intervention. On this. Yeah, go on. Because my training is in mathematics, and I remember that the happiest moments of my life, at least until I met my wife, right? <laughs> were moments when I would lose myself in play. But because I'm not an artist, I'm a coach, as you know. Um, my play involved mathematics because I did, mathematics, yeah. Yeah, I did a mathematics PhD, and I remember the happiest and most creative moments. And in the end, most productive moments, when, when I was actually playing around with mathematical e equations that I was making up completely out of my own head. I was saying, okay, this proposition is impossible. Assume that it is not impossible. What would happen if it were not impossible? What <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Happen, right? So I would spend 10 hours in the middle of the night in England when I used to live back then on a horrible, you know, wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpet lying down on the floor with pieces of paper and writing and writing. And I would come up with stuff that was just nonsensical, you know, just yeah. <laughs> about a world that doesn't exist. Yeah. That was immensely gratifying. For me, that was, you know, that led to some ideas that later on percolated into my work, which mm -hmm. got me jobs and mm -hmm. made me an academic. So they were not completely useless in the end, but they would never have happened if I did these things in order to do something else, as yes. a means to an end. In other words, just like art, good yes. science. You know, if you think about it, look, Descartes came up with a, uh, with a question which was nonsensical. He said, what if there was a number that if you multiply it with itself, you get minus one? Now that mm -hmm. number can never exist. Mm -hmm. And he came up with the imaginary, you know, the square root of minus one. Yeah. Now, today, there would be no Zoom if, if he had not thought of that. He himself yes. did that as, a, as, as a stupid idea. But then Leibniz and Euler, you know, the Germans, took it and turned it into complex number theory, without which there would be no technology. Yes, sure. The car did that for the hell of it, not in order to gain something. That's, that's a kind of art. So, you know, when you say mathematics, if mathematics is a play, you know, like, you know, if, if it's a realm where people actually play for fun, mm -hmm. in the same way that, ch that kids, as you put it, who start um, you know, um, experimenting with different forms and touch this and touch that, making art. So art and science are not at all dissimilar mm -hmm. in that one sense, that they only produce great stuff, great art and great mathematics, if they are done for nothing, for yep. the hell which is exactly the opposite of neoliberalism, because neoliberalism mm -hmm. does not conceptualize that. They always, always do something to get money. Yes. To get, right? So, in a sense, doing proper art and putting proper scientists, science is the very definition of going against neoliberalism. Good. <laughs> now, well, I've got a very good. difficult question for you from our audience. Mm -hmm. I'll read it out. It's a tough one. I don't know how to answer it. You guys are talking from the first world, the developed world. Could you please tell the South what to expect after the virus is defeated? Are we expecting a more messy and unfair world? This is su these are such difficult questions to answer because there won't be one DMTV answer. For you. DMTV yeah. is all about difficult questions. Yes. But there won't be one answer, you know, there, it's going to be very patchy in different places, different things will happen. So, so it's hard to just to make any kind of single prediction, I think. Um, it seems to me that as long as we still have a neoliberal 
structure to our economics, the third world will always suffer. The developing world will always be at a disadvantage because um, the great success, the great triumph of neoliberalism is not, only, not so much the creation of wealth, but the concentration of it. And that process carries on absolutely unstopped um, and continues to accelerate. You know, we, we have more and more wealth concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. And I don't see why, I don't see anything that is happening right now that is going to slow that down. Um, the only thing I think that might actually, that, that I could possibly contribute to, I should say, is a change of attitude about being wealthy. Um, I think that it's going to come to seem very coarse and gross and crude and you know, you know the way you feel about people who drive stupidly expensive cars around and you think that guy must have a very small thing, you know, because <laughs> to, to want a car that big. Um, I, I sort of think there might be a stylistic change in people's attitudes towards wealth. Um, now, this might seem quite trivial in economic terms, but I think this does make a difference to people. For example, there's an art movement, as you know, called minimalism. And minimalism, when it started about 50 years ago, I guess it was, um, seemed sort of quite radical because it was a questioning of this idea that more was better um, and that more detail and more luxurious materials and so on were better. But minimalism, which was initially a stylistic notion like that and it applied to paintings and music has now translated into a sort of social movement um, there's that lady Marie Kondo with her books which essentially you know they're middle class popular books about interior design essentially but what they translate into is an idea that oh do you know what less might be more interesting than more less is cool more is kind of coarse, over the top. Now, people never really take those kinds of ideas very seriously because it takes a long time before, before they have societal effects, but they do have societal effects in the end. I think it does make a difference if, if austerity, for instance, personal austerity, I don't mean <laughs> European Central Bank austerity, but personal austerity becomes a kind of value, stoicism, reduction. Parsimony, as David Hume Par used. Parsimony, oh. yes. Okay. When, when those things start to become a stylistic statement, something big changes, I think. And uh, I can't remember your question as question exactly now. No, the question was about the developing world. Look, there is yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. the last week, let me just speak for as an economist for just a yeah. moment. In the last week, there's been an exodus of money from the development of uh, the smart money, inverted commas smart, that had rushed into countries that uh, uh, were um, uh, open for um, speculators, speculators who were taking bets that those countries would uh, take off. Uh, of course, you know, the, the smart money comes in, it creates bubbles, it creates... Uh, it, it, it empowers the local oligarchy. Uh, the local oligarchy buys a lot of Mercedes Benzes and all those big cars, for, you know, for small things, as you put it. Um, uh, and um, you know, they exploit resources, they shift resources to the, to the first world. And then, the moment the first world has a crisis, that smart money all comes out because they, they fear the valuation of the local currencies. And by coming out, the cause of it, they enhance and they accelerate the devaluation of the local currency. And then they go back to, you know, they are repatriated, leaving nothing but smithereens behind. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been experiencing this in the last week, massively. Never before since the 1970s has so much capital left the developing world. And of course, you know, we don't live in a world that has any kind of international solidarity amongst those who have the power to protect it. Uh, and therefore, you know, we as a um, movement, as DiEM25, as a progressive international, we need to look into that because mm -hmm. you know, uh, 
personal parsimony amongst us in the in the west is not going to solve the problem that all those industries around the developing world have collapsed no no of course it is not no it won't work like that but i i think um i think humans do evolve in their feelings about what is the appropriate way to behave and the the whole issue of climate change is of course one of those evolutions now we are now are aware that we have that we are woven into the ecology of this planet and we can't we can't have the attitude to it that we used to have that it was a sort of infinite reservoir of resources that we could draw upon and chuck out the results into some other river we don't think like that anymore um, so these changes do happen and they they normally start as almost as aesthetic changes they they are hardly scientific at the beginning they're sort of a feeling that this doesn't feel like the right way to be any longer now art is what deals in feelings like that um, and it's the it's the exchanging of those feelings with other people through music and painting and so on that that actually consolidates these kinds of ideas oh we all feel the same way about these things that that is the important part of the revolution actually there's i don't know if you know that book um called everything was forever until it was no more it's a book by a, a russian writer called yobchak i think and it's about the end of the soviet union and where he says that you know until the night before it collapsed it was there and solid and eternal and then suddenly the next day it was gone right. and life went on um, so things can change very 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 quickly but in that in that book he he says something very interesting he says as i recall he says there are two stages in a revolution the first stage is when everyone realizes something is wrong but the important stage is when everyone realizes that everyone else realizes it as well and and at that point just like the, the stock exchange yes you know, the stock exchange collapses when somebody thinks that somebody else thinks that somebody else has realized that there is a yes yes so so i i'm kind of optimistic if if all the billionaires can piss off to pluto and live in their bubbles there but they um, won't <laughs> they won't unfortunately you know threatening us you know they keep promising but they are not going to deliver you know they're going to still you know to remain here and suck the blood out of every human being uh, you know uh, while uh, purporting to be planning to colonize the rest of the, the galaxy and i hope that they don't, they don't uh, you know move to the rest of the galaxy because i'm a star trek fan i'm a trekkie i want captain picard i want captain kirk to be the first representatives of humanity you know using the good old communist high-tech communist principles of um, athletes instead of you know elon musk's very toxic ideology imagine if he is the first representative of humanity in space uh, i prefer to die than even to think of that now we've got six minutes left now i need to apologize for my dog for dot monkey been uh, creating the soundtrack in the distance. He usually for some reason he thinks that he needs to participate. Um, I've got a, one question for me, and then we'll see if we can squeeze another one. Not, maybe not. Uh, my question is this: What is your next? Uh, once you are out of your hole in Norfolk and you are back in uh, Notting Hill, what's your next artwork or music project going to be? Well, my next project was supposed to be. And of course, it's been cancelled like every it's other. Going to be. Forget everything that happened before COVID nineteen is gone. No, it, it's, it's going to be. It, it still will be the next project. It just will be later than it was originally going to be. Um, I'm I'm working on a project at the uh, Serpentine Gallery in Hyde Park in London, uh, which is called Back to Earth. I'm part of this project, and it's it's an attempt really to try to bring together people who are interested in the in the future design of our relationship with the planet so it's a sort of an a big ecological frame and it involves quite a lot of economics i think um which was to say the understanding of how we run this household called the earth um 
uh, you will no doubt be invited quite shortly <laughs> to be part of it. Um, and it, it's sort of an attempt to, for my part, to make this point that many of the changes that become very important human changes start out as either aesthetic senses or spiritual feelings. They start out rather vague. They don't usually start from facts and figures. Um, though those, of course, are incredibly important. But what, what usually gets these movements going are rather vague feelings of this doesn't feel right, or on the other hand, this feels great. This is, this is what we'd rather be. And I would like to make a place where those feelings can come together with the evidence. Mm -hmm. So I, I want the science to be there as well. And I want I want to see what happens when we. Is there going the... to be music? Of course, Sorry? Is there going to be music as part yes. of the installation? Yes, there will be. Yes. Well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, that, that's, I, that, I'm, that's I'm sort of rather vague. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm saying it's it sounds like a major challenge. Is this going to be a sole exhibition or a group exhibition? No, no there are many artists involved. That's not a good thing. Sorry? Many, that's not a good thing because too many artists spoil the broth. <laughs> told, well. too, too many artists spoil the brothel. <laughs> the brothel, all the broth. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like you to have one last statement because we are moving towards the end. We have three minutes left. Um, and I want to give you the floor. Just to wrap up. Remember that um, DiEM25 comprises tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, we have lots of people watching. Um, they all consider them to be divine and, you know, one of the people that give them inspiration. Uh, and that includes me. So, a message to end the night with. I think that the most important thing we have to nurture now is hope some kind of hope that we can we can really make something and that we can make something great and beautiful in the future and i think we know i think we know what will stand in the way of that um, it's not so difficult to see what will stand in the way of that what we want to be clearer about is what is where the seeds of that already are so what i think we can use this period for this few months or maybe few years that we're all in lockdown is is to say what is beginning here what's what's the new thing that's starting here and you know i see little signs of it here and there i see people starting to communicate again to collaborate again I, I think those are green shoots and I want us to all hold on to those and say this, this is the future starting here. Where are you going? You're walking around oh, the room. Thank you. I'm listening to you. <laughs> complete your sentence. <laughs> the close. No, I, I'm complete. I, my, my message is the, there's only hope if we have hope, really. We, we've, got to, we've got to do it. It's not going to be made by anybody else. It's us. Of course. That's the whole point of a prog progressive political movement. It's a Gramscian line that we are not optimistic. We're very pessimistic, but we remain forever hopeful because this is our human and humanist duty. Now, I need to say, I need to give the final word to this little creature here. Say hello. <laughs> say hello. He's been creating all this noise. Okay. <laughs> This is Mowgli. Um, Brian, it's been, as always, an immense pleasure. I think that everybody who's been watching is uh, uh, overjoyed and thankful to you. Uh, we need to stay together, even when we are apart, even when we are in isolation, because the worst enemy of progressives during this period is that this isolation will lead to enhanced privatization. Yeah. Even though we are isolated, we must never allow privatization to succeed. Uh, I thank you. We will do this again. And I hope to 
next time I see you in the Serpentine Gallery, um, and I will I promise to ignore the work of every other artist and con to concentrate on your wonderful piece. Thank you, mate. Thank you, comrade. <laughs> nice to speak to you. Carpe diem to everyone. Keep watching DM, DM TV. Thank you. Bye bye.